this computer. Okay. So we're rolling. Uh, anybody have any questions you'd like to ask me before we continue from uh, last evening's lecture? Anything at all? All righty, let's uh, continue then where we left off last time. We were discussing column design. And we had already talked about the capacity of the column, uh, columns with no moments on them, just pure axial load. And now we're going through some of the prescriptive requirements for those columns. So picking up from where we were last time, we're going to talk about special requirements for columns in seismic regions. And this is for the most part to prevent the sort of failure that we saw on the Oliveview Hospital, those uh, images, those pictures that uh, I showed with you. And uh, it's also to prevent uh, other kinds of failures, uh, which I got some more pictures towards the, the end of this presentation. But uh, basically, every time we come out with a new code cycle, they seem to increase the requirements for doing concrete columns in regions of seismic. OK, so moving forward, columns that are part of the lateral force resisting system, uh, abbreviated as the LFRS, lateral force resisting system, Primarily columns that are part of the special moment resisting frames must be designed per the prescriptive requirements of ACI 318, section 18.7. Columns designed to resist lateral loads as required by section 18.7 are beyond the scope of this course. It, you could spend a whole semester just learning about seismic columns. <clears throat> However, columns not designed to resist lateral loads from seismic, otherwise known as gravity frame columns, still have special detailing requirements when built in areas of seismic risk. ACI 318 section 18.14 gives prescribed requirements for columns not designed as part of the seismic force resisting system. So in other words, when we design concrete buildings in regions of seismic risk, the columns that are there as part of the lateral force resisting system have a whole host of detailing requirements, but all the other columns in the building also have somewhat reduced, but still have a host of prescriptive requirements. ACI section 1814.31 divides columns into two broad categories based on induced moments and shears when deformed by the dis design displacement delta U. Uh, delta U is found from ASCE 7, chapter 12 provisions. Uh, ASCE 7, if I haven't mentioned, is the code book that works in conjunction with your design codes to provide all your loading. Columns whom the design strength VMN and VVN are not exceeded when the moments and shears are induced by the drift and those columns whom design strengths VMN and VVN are exceeded when the moments and drifts are induced by the drift, uh, moments and shears are induced by the drift delta U, or in cases where delta U is either unchecked or otherwise unknown. Category B is by far the most common. Um, it's very, very difficult to get these columns to actually work in shear and moment when you displace them by multiple inches of seismic drift. So generally, well, in fact, in my practice, all our columns fall into this category B. In most cases, real world examples, case A is very difficult to justify. Generally, most columns will fall into case B requirements. Additional detailing requirements, Columns whom design strength VMN and VVN are not exceeded 
when moments and shears are induced by the drift. Per ACI 318, 181432, B. Columns must satisfy ACI 318, 18741, 18752, and 1876, uh, which basically says that the area of longitudinal steel must be between 1 and 6%. Transverse steel must be in accordance with A through F. Transverse steel shall be made of single or overlapping spiral, circular hoops, or rectilinear hoops with or without cross ties. Bends and rectilineal hoops and cross ties shall engage peripheral longitudinal reinforcing bars. Cross ties of the same or smaller bar size as the hoops shall be permitted. Where rectilinear hoops and cross ties are used, they shall provide lateral support to longitudinal reinforcement. In accordance to 25722 and 25723. Reinforcement shall be arranged such that the spacing H sub X of longitudinal bar shall not exceed 14 inches. And where P sub U is greater than 30% of AG F prime C, or F prime C is greater than 10,000 PSI, H sub X shall not exceed eight inches. It's these two right here, E and F, that pretty much dictate that in seismic country in Southern California, you cannot do columns with just four corner bars anymore. You have to have at least eight bars. And if uh, item F kicks in, you gotta have 12 bars. 1876, shear strength. This provision specifies that the shear demand VU will be found by calculating MPR at each end of the column and dividing by the story height, which is beyond the scope of this course. Basically, what you get out of this is for these columns, you don't actually design the column's shear strength by the load, the shear load. You design the shear strength based on developing the complete plastic hinge of the column at both ends and making sure that it will never explode in shear. Additionally, the maximum spacing of transverse steel shall not exceed S naught equal to the lesser of six dB or six inch, where dB is the least diameter of the longitudinal steel. Per ACI 1814.32, C columns with PU greater than 35% of P naught must meet all of the above plus uh, 18757 basically states that any concrete more than four inches outside the transverse steel required above also needs transverse steel as required above. Transverse steel must be at least half of what is required by ACI 318, 18754. And transverse steel required area, ASH over SBC, where HSH ASH is the area of all legs uh, hoops across ties spaced at S transverse to BC. S is the spacing of sets of hoops and cross ties. BC is the width of the column perpendicular to the direction of interest. Okay, so this is basically saying that when you're designing this column and you have to look in both directions for a shear demand, ASH is all the legs of your steel. B sub C is from outside to outside of your ties. And then you have to follow the calculation. The actual required steel is outside the scope of this class, is actually the same as designed in a moment frame. But see ACI 318 table 18754 real required area of steel. Columns whose design strength VMN or VVN are exceeded when the moments and shears are induced by the drift or the drift is unknown. All the requirements that I just said, except that ACI 318, 18754 must be provided in full, not half. This is really the requirement of full ties based on a moment frame. Additionally, ACI 318, 1875, 1876 must be complied. Uh, AC 18753 specifies maximum spacing S naught in N regions, L naught as one fourth of the minimum column dimension, six times the diameter of the smallest longitudinal bar, 
or S naught is equal to four plus 14 minus HX over three, but not greater than six inches nor less than four inches. And 18751, the N regions L naught as depth of the column at the joint face or at the section where flexural yielding is likely to occur, one sixth of the clear span of the column or 18 inches. So in summary, columns will be required to have heavy transverse steel at a maximum spacing of S naught for a distance of L naught from each end of the column within a story and a reduced spacing of six dB or six inches for the middle portion of the column. Most cases, many more longitudinal bars will be required at a maximum spacing of 14 or eight inches, depending on the magnitude of the axial loading. The goal of all of the re regulation, everything that I just talked about, the goal of all of this is to prevent that. That is the reason why we had to go through all that. Any questions so far? Uh, when you say uh, the seismic region, yeah, is it like they're only talking about like the lateral, like earthquakes, or is it also the because uh, I I just known in our structural uh, lab that there's also earthquake that goes up and down. Okay. Um, all <laughs> earthquakes have a, a component of the wave in all three directions. So we usually look at it as north, south is one direction, east, west is another direction. They're orthogonal, right? They're 90 degrees. And then the vertical is orthogonal to the two uh, horizontals. So really the science of earthquake is every single earthquake produces waves on all three axes. We just orientate the axes for something that's convenient for our brains to understand, like north, south, east, west, up and down. But you really could rotate those three coordinate axes to any, any orientation you wanted. And every earthquake has a component in all three of those. Usually the two horizontals are much, much stronger than the vertical, but there's still a vertical that needs to be reckoned with. Um, so back to your original question, when I say seismic regions, that actually has nothing to do with vertical or horizontal. What that has to do with is, is all statistical probabilities. And so what uh, the United States Geological Survey has done is taken the entirety of the California on like a uh, 0.1 kilometer grid and calculated the probability of shaking, the probability of maximum spectral accelerations at a 0.2 frequency and a one second frequency. And uh, calculated that for every 10th of a kilometer through the entirety of the United States. And then they broke up each one of those spectral accelerations into categories. And they have category A, B, C, D, E, and F. And so the whole United States has been subdivided into A through F. If it's a A or B is considered to be low risk. If it is a C, it's a moderate risk, D, E, and F are high risk, okay? And so A and B does not mean there's no earthquakes. It just means that they're very low probability and they're probably very low magnitude. For instance, Manhattan a little while ago had a two point something earthquake. That's yeah, just weird, but it happened. <laughs> But again, it was only a two. That's a two is kind of like a big heavy truck rolling past your, your house. It wasn't much. But the category C is moderate and category D, E, and F are high seismic probability. So if you're building a column in 
certainly D, E, or F, you have to follow everything that I just talked about. If you're building a column in category uh, C, you have to do a lot of it, but not all of it. And it is kind of, it was already too complicated as I presented it. It'd be even more complicated to kind of parse through what is required in C and what is not. Um, to give you an idea, all of California, pretty much all of California, there's a few little places that are C, but most of it is D. Um, good chunks of Oregon, Washington, and Alaska are all D or E or F. Um, and then the weirdest thing is that there's like a hot spot in, um, well, most of uh, Salt Lake City area is like a C, I believe. And then there's a hot spot, and I don't know why, but over by Memphis, Tennessee, and another one over in South Carolina, that is as strong of shaking as you could see in California. So did that, that was a long answer. Did that answer your question? Yes, uh, so it's pretty much like, cover everything in terms of seismic. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, but, thank you. Yeah, sure, sure. So if you're doing column design, again, I use Minnesota because we had a sister plant in Minnesota and I went over there and talked to their engineers and my jaw just dropped. I was just like, you, you, you can't do that. And I'm like, well, yeah, you can. You can do it here in Minnesota. Like, well, you shouldn't be able to do that. I mean, it's just so ingrained that what you're looking on the screen is bad, bad, bad. And that's exactly what they're building in Minnesota. So it, it, just, it makes all the difference in the world, uh, your level of seismic risk. Okay, so the intent of presenting all this information to you, uh, some of it in kind of granular detail, the intent was that you've been exposed to it. You know that if you design columns, there's so much more to column design than just the basic um, calculating VPN compared it to the load. There's all these regulations that you have to follow for column design, particularly if you're designing in a region of moderate to high seismic risk. You can save this presentation. You can go back and watch the YouTube video of this presentation. If you find that you need to actually perform these column designs, I encourage you to go back and review this material and then dig through the code itself line by line to make sure that you're covering all the requirements for designing columns and high seismic risk. This lecture was not intended to prepare you to just jump straight into a job and design a column. But it, this was really just an introduction to all the regulation that is uh, required for these. Okay, so that, that was kind of the intent. I know I spit out a lot of ACI section, blah, 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 point, blah, point, blah, point, blahs. And I, I can't possibly uh, think that anybody's going to remember all those, but it was just an introduction. It was a exposure to the level of complexity that we go through every day designing these columns in Southern California. Again, all of that over the last 50 years of code writing was to prevent this. This is the goal. By requiring, and so this here, see where it says brittle concrete column? This detailing is what you see here, basically, more or less. And you see the ties with these little uh, corner 90 degree ears on it. That's what you see in this photo right here. You can actually see where those ears pulled apart in some places. So this really is what this was. And it didn't work so good. So this is what we do now. And see how you got the closer tie spacing at the top and at the bottom of the column. And you have more longitudinal steel. You can't just use four corner bars anymore. You got to use multiple bars. And you have to have multiple legs of these hoops with these 135 degree ears on them to provide that confinement and the ductility to make these columns so much more robust and resilient to seismic 
energy. Okay, so that's the goal. That's that's why we went through what we just went through. This bad, this good. And this, well, let me throw it out there. Is this bad or is this good? What do you think? Uh, I mean, it fails, so it's bad. <laughs> oh, I think it's good. What is I, it? I can't really. Uh, Did it? Okay. It's a parking structure. It was. Yes. <laughs> Isn't it? The goal is you kind of want the structure to wave. In a so, sense. so you're both right. It is bad that the structure collapsed. Absolutely. That uh, of course, that's always a bad thing to see a building collapse. But the photo is of these columns right here. What failed was actually something in the interior of the building that was not detailed properly and was too brittle. And it failed in the inside and it kind of imploded the whole building. So it wasn't these columns that you're looking at. It wasn't their fault. These are actually moment frame columns designed to carry load the left and right in the image. It wasn't their fault that the building collapsed inside and sucked them in. But the good that I'm illustrating here is that these columns bent over like bananas, literally like bananas, and they're still not failed. So the detailing of these columns was so ductile, so robust, that they went from straight up and down in the air to flopped over on their side and they still haven't failed here at the base. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so again, those moment frames looked a lot more like this. So instead of looking like this when the building deflected, they look like this when the building deflected. And that's the goal. These behaved very, very ductily and they would have been continued to do their job if the rest of the building inside hadn't failed around them. So that's the point of that slide. I think this was uh, UCLA parking. Uh, it, was some, it was Northridge, definitely Northridge. And it was a parking garage, a cast in place parking garage in, uh, Actually, no, it looks like it was a precast. It was a precast parking garage with a cast in place moment frame that failed during Northridge. Isn't that wild? Look at these uh, light poles. And you see that light pole there? That's on top of this column. So it's bent over just a little bit. Another image of the same building. Uh, moment frame beams didn't do so good. But the columns, again, have this unbelievable amount of ductility in them that they survived this being bent over like 45 degrees. Uh, this steel stair didn't do so good it either. It just collapsed, as you can see here. OK, that is our lecture on column design. Uh, any questions on this? All right, if I'm not hearing any questions on that, then let's get going on tonight's lecture. All right, so tonight we are going to move away from column design with pure axial load, concentric axial load. And now we're going to look at the treatment of columns. We're still talking about short columns, so they're not gonna buckle or anything like that. But we're gonna talk about columns that have a combined axial load and a bending moment. And this raises the complexity a bit. So first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna define the centroid of the cross section, the plastic centroid of the cross section. So the plastic centroid of the cross section is the average of these three elements here. It is the yielding force of the rebar. It is the 
total compressive force of the concrete and the yielding force of the rebar here. P0 is located at the resultant of C1, C2, and C3, which equals the plastic centroid. Why is that important? Because if the applied load is not applied through the plastic centroid, then that's the eccentricity. Eccentricities of the load, uh, we, we label eccentricity as little e. Eccentricities of the load are measured from the application of the load to the plastic centroid. That's why it's important. If you have a symmetrical section, see this one is not, I have two rebars, I have three rebars. So you'd actually have to calculate where the plastic centroid of this section is. But in most cases, the column is symmetric. If the column is symmetric, then by observation, you can say that the plastic centroid is right down the center of the column. And any eccentricity of the load from the center of the column is your eccentricity. Okay, so let's look at the effects of combined loading. Here's my column section. I have areas of steel one, two, and three. Looking at a side view, I have my concrete column and I have my rebar one, two, three. I have an applied axial load. The applied axial load is always assumed to go through the centroid, but the moment, okay, so the, let me, let me take that back, take that back, take that back. Axial load is not always assumed to go through. If you have an eccentricity of the axial load, that is the moment. But in this image here, I have resolved that to an axial load through the centroid and an overturning moment. So, so if the axial load is pure compression, so if the axial load is going right through the center of the section and there is no moment, moment is equal to zero, then everything is even Steven. The strains are all equal to the crushing strain of the concrete, zero, zero, three. So the strain in each one of these rows of steel is also zero, zero, three. Everything is at zero, zero, three if you have zero moment. The whole thing is crushing down evenly, okay? That's very important to realize where the strain is. The strain is everything in these things, okay? So the compressive strain in the concrete is 003. Compressive strain in all three rows of steel is also 003. The strain of everything is 003 if you have zero moment, okay? Case number two, if I have a small moment and I still have a large axial load, well, the strain now cannot be even Steven because I have to have some offset of my resultant to line up with the, the axial load that has an eccentricity. So if I have a little bit of moment, then I have to have a little bit of an offset on my strain. The maximum strain is still 003 because the maximum strain is always 003. But notice that it goes from the maximum strain down to something less than maximum strain. So the strain in this third row is close to 003, but the strain goes down as you get further away from the compressive side, okay? So epsilon S1, epsilon S2, epsilon S3 are all still in compression, but they're gonna be less than the yielding strain. Okay, everybody tracking with this? Do I have any questions? Case number three. What if I have a medium moment? Did you have a question? No. Oh, okay. So what happens if I have a medium moment, I still have a large axial load, then the 
strain on the tension side. So you're kind of bending the column over to the right. So on the right-hand side is compression. On the left-hand side is tension because you're bending the column over. So with a medium moment, the maximum strain is always 003. But on the tension side now, I actually have some steel that's in tension. This steel is still in compression. This steel is still in compression. But you can see the trend here. The more moment that I apply, or the less axial load that I apply, the more skewed the strain diagram gets to be. And then what if we have a large moment with a medium axial load? Still 003 on this side. But now my epsilon S1 could be at its yielding stress. So I could actually be yielding the steel on the tension side and still have compression in the steel on the compression side. And this is actually what's known as a balance condition. The balance condition occurs when the steel yields on the tension side, just as the concrete crushes on the compression side. So this number four, is known as a balanced condition. If the strain in the steel is exactly yielding epsilon y when and at the same moment that the concrete crushes, epsilon c equals 003 on the compression side. And then case number five is where the axial load is very small, the moment is large, and this condition here should be very um, recognizable, familiar. This is basically what happens in a beam. A beam has small to no axial load, has a fairly large moment. The steel on the tension side is much larger than the yielding strain. The steel on the compression side may or may not be yielding at that point. And this is what your strain diagram looks like. So the behavior, which this could be all the same physical column. It just depends on the nature of the loading. So the behavior based on loading alone could be pure compression to pure bending or all these intermediate stages in between. Okay, so we have names for this stuff. These over here are called compression controlled because the steel on the tension side, the steel that would have the most tensile stress in it, the steel on the tension side hasn't yielded yet. So if the tension steel hasn't yielded, it's in the compression controlled region. All three of these examples are compression controlled. Then you have the delineator. You have the divider between compression controlled and tension controlled, and that is the balance condition. Again, the balance condition is one finite point where the steel yields just as the concrete crushes. And then if you have more tension than yielding, a greater than yielding strain, then you have a tension controlled and this is starting to act more like a beam. Any questions on this concept? All right, so that was looking at the strain. Now let's look at the same conditions, but looking at the stress condition. So for the pure compression, zero moment, looking at the stress, the whole section, the stress in the steel is at yielding stress because the whole, the whole section has compressed at 003, which is greater than the yielding stress of the rebar at 00207. So all the rebar in the section has yielded, but it's yielded in compression, not tension. And at the same time, every little molecule of concrete in the whole column is at a stress of 0.85 F prime C. 
So in this condition here, everything is yielded and phi is equal to 0.65 because you are strongly in the compression region or compression controlled region. Next case where I had a small moment. Now uh, we can calculate little a. Little a uh, is calculated as uh, beta one times c. So little a starts to be something less than the whole section. When the whole section is activated in compression, then little a is equal to the whole section. But now little a is starting to get to be something smaller than the whole section. The stress in the concrete is still and always will be 0.85 F prime C. But the stress in the rebar here, maybe this rebar is still yielded, but these rebars are at a stress something less than yielding. Next condition, medium moment, large axial load. A is getting smaller still. The stress in the compression steel is now less than yielding. The stress in the middle steel is almost nothing because it's like right at the neutral axis. And the stress on the tension side has gone into tension a little bit, but it's still not yielded. So you're still compression controlled. You still have a fee factor of 0.65. Now we get to our balance condition. The balance condition, the rebar in tension is right at yielding. The other rebars are still in compression, but there's something less than yielding, and A has gotten smaller. The balance condition, phi is still equal to 0.65. Why? Because it's right at yielding. And then the last condition where I have a large moment, small axial load, this is acting much more like a beam now. The stress in the tension steel is fully yielded. The stress in the compression steel may or may not be yielded depending on proportions. A is smaller still, but this section, because the rebar has yielded, is now in the tension controlled region where phi is equal to 0.9. Okay, so this I think is a fairly useful study of the stages as a column goes from complete compression to complete bending. Okay, so here's kind of a summary of what we just talked about. This is the strain condition. This is the stress condition and tension controlled, balanced and compression controlled. Balance condition occurs when the tension steel yields simultaneously with the compressive failure. A balance condition is a result of a unique combination of axial force and bending moment. So in other words, to achieve this balance condition, there's only really one combination of axial load and moment that will achieve exactly this balance condition. It's really, when I say balance, it's like balancing on the knife's edge. Um, so as you'll see, it, it's not really particularly useful in design, but it's useful in creating a construct that allows us to design. I'll, sh I'll show that in a second. From the strain diagrams, you can see that in many cases, the stress in the steel F sub S is less than the yielding stress F sub Y, either in tension or compression. So that's gonna lead us, that's gonna make us come up with some uh, techniques to figure out what that stress is in the steel. This can make solving for a specific case of axial load PU and MU very cumbersome. Um, so we don't do that. Uh, I mean, I, I've written templates and, and algorithms that will do that, but they're far more complex than what we're gonna do in this class. So basically it's very difficult to derive an exact strain diagram, an exact stress diagram to correspond to an exact MU and PU. It can be done. It's just beyond the scope of this class. It's very cumbersome. So what we do is we do something different. Uh, I'll show that in a second. 
First thing is we convert the moment to an eccentrically applied load. So if this is your loading condition. I have a factored moment and a factored axial load. We are going to convert that to an equivalent axial load at some eccentricity. So these two are exactly equivalent. We're just going to think of it in this terms within an uh, eccentricity. So a large moment produces a large eccentricity E. OK, so this is how we design columns. We create interaction diagrams. So this diagram is a capacity threshold, if you will. So if you have zero moment, then the highest possible load a column can carry is P naught. If you have zero axial load, then the highest load this column can carry is M naught down over here. This is basically the capacity of a beam with no axial load. And this is the capacity of a column with no moment. But you have all these points in between. We also see on this diagram the balance point. The balance point, this is the moment that corresponds to the balance point, And this is the axial load that corresponds to the balance point. Remember, the balance point is where the rebar yields just as the concrete crushes. So this gives a more complete picture of a column's capacity. Every point on the red interaction curve represents a capacity at failure for a combination of PN and MN. Each point represents exactly where epsilon sub C equals 0, 0, 003. So in other words, every point on this curve is a capacity when the concrete reaches its crushing strain of 0, 0, 003. But every point on here is a different combination of axial load and moment. And there, there are literally an infinite number of points along that curve. Top P naught axial capacity of the column with a zero moment. Here is the axial and flexural capacity of the column at a balanced condition, which by the way, produces the maximum moment capacity. It's kind of interesting that the curve kind of hooks back in. This is the point of maximum moment capacity. And maximum moment capacity is at some axial load, not at zero axial load. So that's just one of the uh, outcomes of this. And then flexural capacity of the column, if you have zero axial load, is represented here. Since the eccentricity is defined as E is equal to moment over axial load, then one over E is equal to the slope of a radial line from the origin here to a failure point on the curve anywhere along here. So this purple line is the eccentricity. It's a unique eccentricity that corresponds to exactly the balance point. Slope represents E sub B uh, B representing the balance point. And E is equal to zero. This would be zero eccentricity at that point there. And E is equal to infinity is equal to basically M over zero is infinity. So this would be the eccentricity if you have zero axial load. And the moment capacity is reduced by less axial load as you get past the balance point here. Uh, from the balance point all the way over this way, this whole region of the chart is compression controlled. Oops, that was the end of that. And the whole region from here to here is your tension controlled region. OK, so this is our interaction curve for capacity, nominal capacity. So here's P naught, here's Pn, and here's Mn. These are all nominal capacities. ACI 318, section 
421 and table 22421 prescribe that PN is equal to 80 or 85% of P naught, depending on the use of ties or spirals. Okay, so we talked about this last lecture. This is a minimum, this is a provision that accounts for a minimum eccentricity. Now, I know it didn't make sense when I talked about it last time, when I said that the 0.8 or 0.85 gives you a minimum eccentricity. But now you can see how that works. If I take P naught and I knock it down by 15 or 20% and I carry that straight across, so this becomes a cap on my maximum axial load, this is my cap. Well, where this cap intersects the curve, that is an eccentricity. This line, the slope of this purple line represents an eccentricity. And where it intersects here, the slope of that purple line is my minimum eccentricity. So that's where that comes in. The eccentricity created by the reduction on P naught represents the minimum design eccentricity for the column. And why do we have this in here? Because just due to uh, variances of construction and uh, offsets of loading, all kinds of things we have no control over, there is no such thing in the real world as a concrete column with zero eccentricity. The, practically impossible. So there's always going to be some minimal amount of eccentricity on your designs that you may not be accounting for, but the code has you covered by knocking you down from, if this dotted line is what is your theoretical capacity, the code caps you to the solid line to account for that eccentricity, okay? So on the nominal side, that's where last time we talked about 0.8 or 0.85 P naught, that's represented now by this solid red line. Once you get to this point here, you're back to the nominal capacity as calculated. And like I said, slope represents the minimum eccentricity. The diagram is still a representation of nominal capacity. For allowable capacity, we looked at table 2122 for the applicable fee factors. And this is what it looks like. The blue curve represents your allowable capacity of the column. And there's a big difference there, you see, between what theoretically the column could carry the red curve. Now we're only allowed to design to the blue curve. The axial capacity is reduced by 35% because your fee is 6.65. So axial capacity from nominal to allowable is reduced by 35%. That's this big jump right there. Both axial and flexural capacities are also reduced by 35% over here because you're still in that compression zone. So your fee is 0.65. So your axial capacity drops and your moment capacity both drop by six to the 0.65. So that's why this surface here is so far inboard of this surface here. So that's that V factor reduction. But down here at the bottom where you're in the tension controlled zone and you're basically looking at pure bending, now your uh, pure uh, flexural capacity is only reduced by 10% because for bending, if your epsilon sub T is greater than 0, 0, 0.05, then phi is equal to 0.9. So that's what this represents. That's only a 10% drop between nominal and allowable capacity. Notice the kick in the diagram towards pure moment due to a linearly increasing phi factor in the tension controlled area. So phi is equal to 0.65 until you get right to there. And then once you start yielding, uh, and you get a little bit past your yielding, the phi factor starts growing from 0.65 to 0.9 by that equation that we had. And that's what creates this uh, little kick down there. Any questions on this diagram?
Okay. Is anybody like totally, utterly, and hopelessly lost and yet still brave enough to tell me that? I am, but I, but I feel like once we see an example, it'll yeah. probably make it probably make more sense. Fair enough. Totally, totally fair enough. Um, yes, that that's why I build in a lot of examples so you can kind of see how this works. But if I jump straight into the example without laying down all this groundwork, then you wouldn't know the big picture. You wouldn't know where we're going. Um, but yeah, fair enough. Okay, so let, let's get to where we can do an example. Okay, before we do, let's talk about fee factors again for just a moment. So for a spiral column, and re remember when we're talking about beams, I made such a big deal about epsilon sub t has to be greater than 004, but you have a penalty. And if epsilon sub t is greater than 005, then phi is equal to 0.9, there's no penalty. All of that that I talked about still applies, absolutely still applies. It's just now that we're not limited by that 004 anymore. Why? Because we're talking about columns now, not beams. <coughs> In beam design, epsilon sub t cannot be less than 004. You have to redesign the beam. In column design, epsilon sub t could be anything. It, it could be in compression. It, it, that's the nature of column design. But if epsilon sub t is less than the yielding, if epsilon sub t is less than epsilon t y, this is the yielding strain, then for a spiral column, v is 0.75. If epsilon sub t y or epsilon sub t is between yielding and this golden magical 005, then here's your interpolation. If epsilon sub t is greater than 005, then phi is equal to 0.9, like I've been saying all along. But this is for a spiral column. That's why this is 0 0.75, 0 0.75 here in, in this iteration here. For a tied column, which is by far the most common case, then if epsilon sub t is less than or equal to the yield, phi is 0.65. If epsilon sub t is between the yield and the magical golden 005, here's this iteration again. This is exactly the same iteration we did for beams if epsilon sub t is less than 005. It's just that you don't have that 004 limitation anymore. And just like with beams, if epsilon sub t is greater than 005, phi is equal to 0.9. Okay, so this is not changing anything that I said for beam design. It's just expanding it to the whole spectrum for column design. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, so design interaction curves. So what we're gonna do, our whole job is to create this blue curve. And then what we do is we design a column with combined axial load and bending. We must first construct a design interaction curve. So we create this blue shape. Then we plot the points of our factored loads, MU in the X direction, PU in the Y direction. So you go over MU, you go up PU, and you plot that point. If the point falls inside the curve, then the design is fine. If the point out lands outside of the curve, the design is unacceptable. Okay, so this is how we do column design. Like I said, you can't really calculate a phi PN and a phi MN for any particular combination like you can for a single single beam because there's just an infinite number of combinations that would get you there. So it's not practical, but it is practical to create this shape which is framed over a few key points 
And once you find those key points, you can kind of stitch this thing together. And once you got that interaction, then it's super simple to just either plot inside or outside of the curve to see if it works or if it doesn't work. So that's how this works. OK, example number one. Are we ready? Somebody? Anybody? Yes. Awesome. So at 606, we will meet it back after our break, and we will knock this thing out. What do you say? Sounds great. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> OK. <laughs> You're so enthusiastic. I, I, I thought you'd jump on it. All right. Uh, I'll be back at 606. What did I say? 606? I will yep. be back. I will be back at 606 and we will finish it out from there.
Okay. I am back and we are ready for exa example number one. So here we go. <clears throat> this is our column. It's a 16 by 16 column. We have four number nines on the near face. We have four number nines on the far face and they are located at two and a half inches from the edge of the column. And we have 5,000 PSI concrete. We have, this is assumed to be a tied column, which is a good assumption. You can't put a spiral in that uh, rebar configuration. Rebar is 60 KSI. The axial load, and you notice the U right there tells you that this load is already factored. So the factored axial load is 400 kips. The U for the M tells you this is already a factored moment. The moment is 200 kip feet. And what is required is to construct a column interaction diagram by finding phi PN and phi MN points for each of the following. So these are the points that we're gonna plot out in order to construct this diagram. Point A is point of pure compression. B is zero tension at the tensile steel. C is that balance condition. D is a fully yielded condition where epsilon sub T is equal to zero, zero, five. And E, the last point is at zero axial load. Now these points is what I would consider a minimum. This is like a minimum of five different points to frame out that interaction diagram. When we actually do this in uh, real world, when we do this with a computer aided design, uh, it will actually calc out hundreds of different points. These are just five convenient points uh, that are like zero tension. You'll see how that makes it easier to figure out what the conditions are. But anyway, these are our five minimum points to frame out the interaction diagram. And so we need to answer this question. Is this column safe to carry the design loads? Solution. All right, let's we'll start with point A, pure compression. We're gonna go through and work through all five points to get that interaction diagram that we're looking for. Point A, pure compression. So with pure compression, uh, the strain in all the fibers are at 003. It's evenly loaded. Everything is being squashed down together. And the rebars are going to be yielded because the strain is 003, which is greater than the yielding strain of the rebar. So P0, and, and by the way, this pure compression, this condition here is what we learned how to do last lecture. That's what we did last lecture. So P0 is equal to 0.85 F prime C, AG minus AST plus FY AST. So AG is 16 by 16 column, 16 by 16 is 256 inches squared. AST is eight number nines. So that's eight times one inch squared is eight inches squared. So then P naught filling in F prime C, A, G, A, S, T, F, Y, and A, S, T gives me 1,534 kips. That's P naught. P N, my nominal capacity, because this is a tied column, is 80%. So 80% of P naught is 1,227 kips. V P N is then my nominal capacity further reduced by the fee factor. The strain in my steel is nowhere near the yielding strain in tension. It's actually past the yielding strain in compression. So we are way into the compression controlled zone. And so fee is 0 0.65. 0 0.65 times PN is 65% of 1227 is 798 kips. And my phi P naught, just for illustration purposes, would be 65% of P naught is 997 kips. My phi MN is equal to zero 
because this was a pure compression by definition. And also, if you looked at the symmetry of this, everything on the left of the center line is exactly balanced by everything on the right of the center line. There is no eccentricity, there is no moment. So phi m n is equal to zero. Okay. Let's go back here. Okay, so that's point A. That's my pure compression element. Any questions about the first fifth of this problem? Okay. Point B. Let's look at point B where we have zero tension. So our definition of zero tension is at the tension steel. See, so see this graph here lines up with this. The leading edge here is my maximum compression. And at the center of my rebar, by definition, I have zero tension. That's what we're defining. So that means that I have my neutral axis is right at the centroid of this steel. And so C, the distance from the compression to this uh, neutral axis, is defined as exactly the distance to the center of that steel. Now, there's nothing special about this arrangement here. It's just convenient. Like I said, we're just picking five convenient points that are easier to analyze so that we can frame that interaction diagram. Uh, we, there's nothing magical about this. It's just easier to figure out what's going on if we look at the particular case where this is equal to zero. So at this point, then little c is equal to exactly d, the distance from the compression to the center of the tension steel, which is 16 minus two and a half, which is 13.5 inches. Beta one is equal to point eight zero, because this is 5,000 PSI concrete. You can look that up in table A.7. So little a is equal to beta 1c, which is 0.8 times 13.5, gives me 10.8 inches for my distance of the compression block, little a. Therefore, my compression in the concrete is equal to 85% of F prime C, that's my stress. The area is gonna be the area gross minus the area of steel prime. The gross area of concrete that's in compression is equal to, here, let me uh, elaborate a little bit. I can draw it. Looks just like that. So that this distance right there, the depth of my compression block is little a, 10.8 inches. The width of my compression block is 16 inches. And the stress of my compression block is 0.85 F prime C. And then I subtract out any steel that's inside of my compression block. This steel over here is not in my compression block, so I don't have to worry about it. But I do subtract out the four square inches of steel that is inside of my compression block. So that's why I have 0.85 F prime C, A times B minus the area of steel in that block. And that gives me 717.4 kips is the compression in the concrete. The compression in the steel is equal to F prime S, the stress in the compression side steel times AST prime, but has the compression steel yielded or not? We don't know. So from similar triangles, because you can see I have triangles here. So from similar triangles, I can say that epsilon sub C over C, so 0, 0, 003, over this distance C is proportional to the strain in my compression steel, epsilon S prime 
over C minus two and a half inches. So using that, I can then solve for epsilon S prime is C minus two and a half over C times 0, 0, 003 gives me 0, 0, 00244. So has the steel yielded or has the steel not yielded if my strain is 0, 0, 00244? Anybody? It yielded. It did yield, yes. What's the yielding strain for grade 60 rebar? You kind of have to know that to be able to get through these problems. Yielding strain for grade 60 rebar, the yield strain is always equal to the yielding stress divided by Young's modulus. So for grade 60 rebar, that is 60 KSI divided by 29,000 KSI is Young's modulus equals 0 0.0207 inch per inch. Okay, you, can't, you, you really have to know how to do that in order to do these problems because everything is based on strain. Is it above the yielding strain? Is it below the yielding strain? 00244 is greater than 00207. Therefore, the rebar has yielded. Wait, uh... Can you put that back if you can? <laughs> if not, it's okay. I'll look at the lecture. Let me let me put it up here so that it doesn't get wiped out. Okay. Yielding strain, and I, I can't type epsilon, right? So that's that's epsilon y is equal to the yielding stress divided by Young's modulus. For grade 60, that's 60 divided by 29,000 which equals 0 0.00207. Okay. So the 00244 is greater than epsilon y, the yielding strain. Therefore, the compression steel has yielded. Therefore, the force in the compression steel is equal to 60 KSI times the four square inches of the steel that's in compression. So that, that's 240 kips. <clears throat> so I have in my compression block, 717.4 kips of compression in the concrete, and I have 240 kips of compression in the compression steel, as you see here. So the blue is my compression block, of width A and 0.85 F prime C stress gives me C sub C. C sub C is 717.4 kips. The red is the steel and the steel gives me 240 kips of compression. Why am I not adding my tension steel? Where's my tension steel force? Is it on the other side, the left side? It is because this point B was defined as zero, oh, tension. zero tension. My neutral axis is right smack on my tension steel. So T, the tension force in this problem is exactly zero. That's why it's not here. So I sum all the forces that I do have in the vertical direction to find what P sub N is. P sub n, the allowable or the nominal axial load has to balance what is built into this thing. So sum the forces in the vertical equal to zero, minus Pn, because it's going down, 
plus C sub C because it's going up plus C sub S because it's going up all equal zero. So P sub N, I just uh, put it on the other side of the equal sign. P sub N is equal to 717.4 plus 240 kips gives me 957.4 kips. That is my nominal capacity at this strain condition. To find MN, I'm gonna sum the moments about the right side edge here. It's just a convenient place to sum moments. So sum of moments is equal to zero. So I have PN as I just found what that PN is. And PN is at the center of the section, the plastic centroid that we talked about. So PN is always located at the plastic centroid or half of 16. C sub C is always equal to A over two. This distance right there is A over two. And there's a typo. C sub S, the compression in the steel is located at D prime. So I plug in the real numbers, 957.4 times eight inches, minus 717 times A is 10.8 over two, minus 240 kips times two and a half inches, gives me a grand total of 3185 kip, I think that's kip inch. Yeah, two typos and one, okay, hold on a second. I gotta fix that, uh, where did that all start? Um, right there. Okay, 153. Professor. Yeah. For these problems, for these problems, are we going to have to do all five steps? Yeah. yeah. How long does that take? Uh, <laughs> me? Oh, to 15, 20 minutes. I don't know for us, probably like more. <laughs> maybe, maybe a little bit more. Uh, C sub C typo. Okay, got that. All right. Um, but I don't ask you to do a lot of them. And they are very, very instructive because you kind of got your feet wet with uh, beam design, flexural design. And, but you're you're basically during beam design, flexural design, you're basically following my examples and following these rules. What happens with these column designs is it really kind of shows how it all comes together because all the principles, everything we've talked about up till now, all gets thrown into these column designs. So they're really very instructive as to how concrete as a material actually works not within the confines of just a singly reinforced rectangular beam, but in a more open general sense, how this reinforced concrete works. So this stuff, these five steps is really the pinnacle of reinforced concrete design. Okay, so if that wasn't a motivating rebuttal to why are we doing so much work, I, I don't know what else I can tell you. Yeah, okay, he's not buying it. All right, well, let's just keep going. No, yeah, I'm, I'm listening, but <laughs> yeah. It's very instructive, but yeah, we yeah. do have a homework uh, where you go through these five steps and uh, you know, it's, it's about the same work as doing like three diff different beam designs. It's not terribly cum cumbersome, but yeah, it's a little bit of work to go through and figure this out. Okay. Okay. All right, so we summed our moments. I had a typo. I have another typo here. That's kip inch, not kip feet. So I divide by 12. I get MN is equal to 265.4 kip feet. Since epsilon sub T is in this case, epsilon sub T, according to my strain diagram is exactly zero. So it's still less than the yielding strain at uh, tension, the tension yielding strain. So because of that, phi is still equal to 
we're still very much rooted in the compression controlled region. So phi PN is 65% of PN, which is 622 kips. Phi MN is 65% of MN, which is 173 kip feet. Please catch this. We use the same phi factor for both of these components always. You never put like 0.65 on the axial load and 0.9 on the moment. It's always the same phi because it's the same behavior. So I got phi PN and phi MN are both 0.65. Why? Because the strain in my tension steel is not more than the yielding strain in tension. Okay, so that's point B. Any other questions on point B? Point C. I have a question. Sure. What happened when the steel does not yield it? What happens? Yeah, like let's say you solve for ES and it does not yield it. It's less right. than. Yes, yes. That, that's than... exactly what happened here. This, the strain in the tension steel is exactly zero, so it's nowhere near the yielding in tension. Um, what do you mean by what happens? I mean, oh, is... so like uh, you're asking if the compression steel yielded, right? Yes. And then let's say our ES prime is less is less than EY. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. Well, then to find the stress in the compression steel, you can't just use 60 KSI. If it was less than the yielding strain, then you have to multiply the yielding strain by Young's modulus to get to what the actual stress in the compression column is. And it would be something less than 60 KSI. Oh, so you adjust the what type of uh, uh, steel that we're using? No, no, oh, no, wait. you don't You don't adjust the type of steel. The steel is what it is, but you adjust the stress in that steel because it's below the threshold of yielding. Ah, uh, okay, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Okay, mm -hmm. and I, I, I think one of these points will have something like that. So you'll see it in action. OK. OK. Point C. Now, by definition, the tensile steel has yielded from similar triangles. Uh, where's my diagram? Well, remember, the balance condition is where the tensile steel, this steel, yields just as the concrete crushes on this side. So the strain on the compression is 0, 0, 003. The strain on the tension is 00207. That's the definition of the balance condition. OK, there's my illustration. OK, so the definition of the balance condition is that the concrete is at 003. Simultaneously, the steel is at exactly the yielding strain, which for grade 60 is 00207. So that gives you this uh, diagram. This gives you the proportionality of strain. And from that, you can calculate where is the neutral axis at a distance C. So that's what this is. Similar triangles, 003 over C is equal to this strain plus this strain over a distance D. So epsilon C over C is equal to epsilon S plus epsilon C over D. And solve for C, C is equal to 13 and a half, that's distance D times 003 plus 003 plus 00207 gives you 7.99 inches. That calculates, so now we know where the neutral axis is in this strain condition. Therefore, A is equal to beta 1C, equal to 0.8 times 7.99 is 6.39 inches. So 
Again, that gives you the dimensions of your Whitney stress block. Now it's looking like this as shown here. So this is distance A, the stress. This is just a view of this in plan view. So the compression in the concrete is equal to 0.85 F prime C, area gross minus the area of steel in the compression zone here. So that's going to be 0.85 times 5,000. The depth of my compression block is 6.39, as I just solved. The width is 16. And all the steel inside of it adds up to 4 inches squared. That gives me 417.5 kips. Epsilon prime S, the strain in my compression steel, as we did before, is uh, C minus D prime over C times 003. I get 00206, which is less than the yielding strain. So now back to your question, Adriel. This is exactly what you're talking about. What if that compression strain is, does not yield? Well, then we use uh, Hooke's law that F prime S, the stress in the steel, is equal to the strain in the steel times Young's modulus which is 00206, as we just found, times 29,000 KSI, gives me very close to the yield, but less. So now we're at 59.78 KSI instead of 60 KSI. Therefore, the compression in the compression steel is the stress in the steel times the area, 59.78 times four is 239.1 kips. That's the compression steel component as labeled here. What about my tension steel? Well, now I actually have a tension force in my tension steel. Why? Because the tension steel has yielded as defined by this balance condition. So because the tension steel is right at the yield, then I'm guaranteed that the stress in the tension steel is 60 KSI. 60 KSI times this four inches squared of steel gives me 240 kips. So my tension is 240 kips. My compression is up to 39.1. My concrete is up 417.5. And I sum all the forces in the vertical to find PN. So minus PN plus C sub C plus C sub S minus T, because T is down, equals zero. And I plug in my C sub C, C sub S, T, PN is equal to 416.6 kips. Professor, um, where are you getting the four from? I'm trying to get it from the picture. Is it? Right here. Four oh, okay. Four number nines on the compression mm. side and four number nines on the tension side. Oh, so they has four on each side. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so the, the steel inside the compression block is four number nines. So that's this four inches squared. And the steel on the tension side is four number nines. So that's this four inches squared. Got it, thanks. Sure. All right, now to find M sub N, we sum the moments about the right-hand side again. And we have PN times H over two, because PN is always through the plastic centroid. We have the compression in the concrete times A over two, compression in the steel times D prime. And now we have this added tension times distance D from the right-hand side. Plug in my numbers, 416.6 times H over two is eight, or 17.5 times A over two, 239.1 times D prime and positive 240 times my D of 13.5. And that all adds up to 4641 kip inch or 386.8 kip feet. Now, since epsilon sub T is exactly equal to epsilon Y of 00207, my phi is still 0.65. If you uh, 
several slides ago, we talked about phi and I gave you that interaction equation. If you plugged in epsilon t equal to 0, 0, 00207, that interaction equation would get you exactly 0.65. You're right on the threshold of interpolating phi, but you're right at the bottom of the threshold. So it's still 0, 0.65. Therefore, phi pn is 0.65 times pn, gives me 271, and phi mn is 0.65 mn, which gives me 252. Okay, so these are my two coordinates for point C. Any questions on point C? Okay. Let's jump ahead to point D. Okay, D is very similar to point C, except that instead of the tension steel being right at yield, now the tension steel is at a strain, a tensile strain of 0, 0, 005. So it is beyond yielding on the tension side. So by definition, the tensile steel has yielded because it's beyond that. So from similar triangles, again, we can, we're solving for little c. Here's my diagram. Looks very similar to the last one, except now the strain is 0, 0, 005 instead of 0, 0, 0207. So that makes little c even smaller. So we use uh, similar triangles to solve for C. Now we have 13.5 times the 003, which comes from the concrete strain over 003 plus 005, gives me a C of 5.06 inches. A is beta one times C, which is 4.05 inches. Therefore, the force in the concrete, 0.85 F prime C, AG minus AST, is 4.05 times the width of 16 minus my four square inches of steel in the compression zone. So now my compression is 258.4 in the concrete. And by the way, notice these diagrams here. If you go back and review this, these diagrams are to scale. So each time we do a step, you notice that A is getting smaller and smaller. Epsilon prime S, solving for the strain in my compression steel using the same similar triangles, I get 0, 0, 00152, which is now significantly less than the yielding strain. So my stress in the compression steel is my strain times Young's modulus, gives me 44.02 KSI now. So the force in the compression steel is 4402 times four square inches is 176.1 kips. That's C sub S here. My tension steel, my tension steel is well beyond the yield. So it's 60 KSI times the four square inches on the tension side gives me again, 240 kips. So I sum all the forces in vertical direction, solve for P sub N and I get, 258.4 plus 176.1 minus 240 is 194.5 kips. MN, same idea, sum all your forces from the right-hand edge. And I have my C sub C times eight inch, I'm sorry, my P sub N here times eight inches minus my C sub C times A over two minus 176.1 times D prime, plus 240 times 13 and a half is D. That gives me 38.32 kip inch or 319.4 kip feet. But now epsilon sub T is greater than or equal to, it's actually equal to 0, 0, 005. Therefore my phi now is 0.9 because I finally got to the top of that iterative point where any strain greater than 005 grants you a phi factor of 0.9. So 
as I mentioned, that same phi factor is applied to the axial load and to the moment. So I have a phi PN of 175 and a phi MN of 287. And our last point, well, any questions on that point? Okay, so the last point is zero axial load. PN is equal to zero. So this is pure bending. So this section in pure bending is really the same thing as a compression steel or doubly reinforced beam, which we already learned how to do. So we're gonna follow the same procedure as we use for compression beams. We're gonna solve for a row on the tension side, 0, 1, 8, 5, 2. We're gonna solve for a row on the compression side, which is the same, 0, 1, 8, 5, 2. Then remember our test for if the compression steel yields or not. If rho minus rho prime is greater than this number, then the compression steel will yield. But rho minus rho prime is equal to zero. So the steel will not yield. So then we have to write our force equations in terms of little c. The compression steel is A prime S times F prime S, which is A prime S is four inches squared times F prime S is equal to 87 KSI C minus D prime over C. This, remember, you can go back to that lecture on compression steel. That's where this is coming from. And you can resolve it to 348 kips times C minus two and a half over C. The tension side is equal to four square inches times 60 KSI. There's no variable there. That's 240. And the compression in the concrete is equal to 0.85 F prime C B times beta one times C. And that calcs out to 54.4 times C. Add it all together and you have 240 minus 348 times C minus two and a half over C minus 54.4 C all equal to zero. This of course is a quadratic. Resolve it to 54.4 C squared plus 91 C minus 870 equal to zero. And you may use whichever method is your favorite for solving quadratics and you will get a positive root of 3.25 inches. Now that we have this, we can calculate A as beta one times C, 2.6 inches. F prime S is equal to 87 KSI, C minus D prime over C. Plug in those values now, you get 20.1 KSI. And C sub S then is four times 20.1 is 80.3 kips. T is the same, four times 60 KSI is 240 kips in tension. My compression is 0.85 F prime C, B, A. I have all those numbers now, plug that in, 176.8. To find the capacity, I sum the moments about the top of the beam. T, D minus C times A over two minus C sub S times D prime gives me 2809 kip inch or 234.1 kip feet. But what about P sub n? What happened to P sub n? Well, the problem statement is that P sub n is equal to zero. There is no axial load. And you can um, verify that by summing all your forces in the vertical and you'll find that 80.3 plus 176.8, little bit of a round off there, there, but that equals 240. That should equal 240. It seems like there's more than a little bit of round off there. Uh, let's see what happened there. 176.8. And I got 240. 
Okay, I'll figure that out later. And this is slide 297. T does not equal C. I must have a typo in here someplace is what I'm saying. But if I, okay. So basically the axial load is equal to zero. So if I sum up all my vertical components, these should all two equal zero because there's no residue axial load. So I'll dig into this and see why I'm off by a few kips. And I'll get back to that. But the idea again is zero axial load. It's all in the moment. This is your uh, nominal moment capacity here. Uh, because epsilon sub t is greater than zero uh, zero five in this case, then uh, the moment is uh, phi is equal to 0 0.9, and you have a capacity allowable capacity of 211 kip feet. P naught is equal to zero. All right. So what did all of that work get you? What was the uh, point? I have a question, Professor. Sure. So for point E, yeah, this is just like uh rotated 90 degrees for the beam right exactly and then uh can you go back to the slide just to clarify that cs is equals to as prime fs prime right not fy <laughs> yes okay absolutely cs it must have been late when i did this one prime s F S. Yep, absolutely right. Okay. And somewhere in here, as I mentioned, somewhere in here, I've got a round off error, or I got, I got something going on because this plus this should equal two forty exactly. Uh, so I'll fix that as well. But losing sight of the big picture. What's the big picture? The big picture is point A got me this point right here, right there. And then remember I solved a phi P naught, which is up here, 997. This doesn't actually give me anything except that I need to be able to draw this line. And the slope of this line is established by this point and this point. So I needed to calculate phi P naught just to give me at an imaginary point up here, so that I could connect these two dots. And then I draw a horizontal straight off of VPN to get me to this point, okay? So that got me this line segment, this line segment, this is point B, this is point D, this was point E, this is point, wait a minute, A, B, C, no, no. This is point A, this is point A prime, B, C, D. And then the last one we just did is point E. So you can see now how when you plot all these points, you get this framework. This is your allowable interaction diagram. Okay, kind of stumbled on that one a little bit, but uh, were any questions on how we got this? Okay, so that was the first part of the solution. Draw the interaction diagram. We drew the interaction diagram. The second part was, is the load okay? Is this column design acceptable? So by plotting points A through E, we get this interaction diagram. On the interaction diagram, we can plot our design load demand, MU and PU. Remember, we had MU is 200 kit feet, PU is 400 kips. Since this point is inside of the curve, then the column design is adequate for this loading. Most designs in practice will have multiple load cases, all of which will be to be plotted and confirmed to fit inside the interaction curve. I do column designs, uh, of course I use software, 
but I'll have dozens and dozens of load cases that I have to confirm. By calculating and plotting more points, the diagram becomes more accurate, right? So this is what it looks like with only five points that we just did. This is what it looks like with many, many more points plotted out. And then this is where that uh, phi transitions. So this is where uh, epsilon sub t is equal to epsilon y. This is our yielding strain. So anything on this side of the yielding strain, my tension steel has yielded. And anything on this side, my tension steel has not yielded yet. And this maximum point down here is where phi is equal to 90%. This is my minimum eccentricity where these two segments intersect. And this is what the exact same column and the exact same column interaction diagram looks like on uh, SP column. This is a uh, commercial software. And so these points here are calculated with many hundreds hundreds of calculated points. So again, we just picked five and they were there was nothing special about those five other than they were strategically picked because they they ease they were easier to calculate. They had something like zero tension or that the tension was known to be the yield or something about them made them more conducive to uh, calculating. With the software, of course, it can just calculate any point at once anywhere along the strain diagram. Okay, and let's see. Let's stop here because this is a whole nother segment now on column design using uh, charts and design aids. And I don't wanna start that and get like two minutes into it and then we got to quit. So this seems like a good stopping point to me. And I've got lots of typos that I need to fix on this one. So we're going to stop at 315 lecture 11. Okay, uh, any questions for me? All right, hearing none, I uh, hope everybody has a great weekend. Try to stay cool and we will see you next Tuesday. Oh, I have a, it's just a question. Sure. Do you like do the, like for the curve, do you like do like integration of it to find like each point? like when manually calculating it? Uh, let me get back to, oh, I didn't, I stopped sharing. Yeah. Um, when you, I'm sorry, what do you mean? When I do the like curve? Like we're, we're doing the points, right? Yeah. And each point, it created a curve. In well, our case, it, it's just a line. But if you have like a many, many points, yes. it will create a curve, right? Yes. So, and i mean it's it's not like is it is it just like just the computer to solve it or is there like uh other ways with calculating it manually well you can do it manually but as uh i think it was alejandro uh demonstrated it's a lot of work as he so keenly pointed out it's a lot of work <laughs> right yeah. so our example in what did it take us like about an hour or so? We went yeah. through five points. Or five points. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so the computer I, goes through hundreds and hundreds of points, but it's a little faster than humans, right? Yeah. Um, but I think to answer your question, Adriel, it doesn't do any kind of integration because we're not doing like remember mechanics and materials when we found the uh 
the modulus of uh, resilience. Mm -hmm. Remember that? And the modulus of toughness. We actually had to find the area under the stress strain curve for that material. And in order to find those moduluses, we had to integrate the area under the curve. But this is not like that. We're not integrating. We're not interested in the area under this curve. All we're interested in is that any load that we plot is inside the curve. The curve is just a boundary between acceptable and unacceptable. Ah, OK. Yeah, I, I just realized that well, we're not doing any of the area inside of it. It's just if we're just if if the point is inside of that threshold, then we're good. That's right. It's just a boundary between acceptable and unacceptable. OK. Oh, are we, are we going to have to draw these in their homework? I don't think so, right? Well, yeah, yeah. It's but just five points, though. It's yeah. just five points. Yeah, it's just, you know, pull out a ruler and draw five lines. <laughs> so, so that point, so the points that are like, it says point where feed transitions from 0 0.65 and 0 0.9, how do you, we just like follow this curve here? Like, a, yeah, you know, no, some, you're not going to have to worry too much about that, but okay. you, you didn't get that from the finished interaction diagram. You got that from looking at the condition of epsilon sub t, the strain in the tension steel at each point that you did solve for. Okay. Okay. So remember, we went through each point. At the end of each one, I made a point of pointing out what the fee was equal to. Mm -hmm. Fee is equal to 0 0.65, 0 0.65. If I had actually picked a point somewhere between yield and 005, then you would have had a fee that was uh, iterated or interpolated. You would have had a fee that was interpolated. So it would have been 0 0.8 or 0 0.85 or something like that. But we didn't do any points between the yield and 005. We did one point at yield and another point at 005. So we just drew a straight line right through that interpolation. Right. OK. Yeah, that makes sense. OK, thank you, Professor. OK, you're welcome. OK, guys, have a good night. Have a good weekend.